In this lecture, we will be looking at analysis of variance, or ANOVA, for multiple linear regression. So let's recall our model. We have P predictors, X1 through XP, which we might just lump into a vector X to make the notation a little bit easier. We have response variable Y, and then we have observations, N of them, and observations for the predictor vector and for the response variable. And the idea here is we start to look at the quality of our regression. A regression is only really any good if it has some type of explanatory power. And the analysis of variance is really the first step in trying to look at that and really delve into what is this regression telling you. And what we really focus on is the prediction in Y. So we take an approach where we partition the total variation in Y into two parts. One part, what can be predicted by X. And the second part, what cannot be predicted by X. And we use these three ideas, the total variation in, of Y, the part of it that can be predicted by the predictors and the part of it that cannot be predicted by the predictors to say something about this regression. And we work basically in a percentage basis. We develop, we're going to develop something called the R square. And just to remind ourselves of what we're doing, if we take the one dimensional case, or rather what I mean by that is P equals one, and you have our predictors down here, or we can think of collapsing the entire uh, RP into that axis. And we are then doing this least squares best fitting regression line. And the idea is that we have variation. If we look at one of these points, we have the ith value for the predictors, and you have here the actual response in the ith case from the data, but that predicted case, the regression would tell you this is where you expect your yi hat to be using this linear relationship with xi as prediction for yi. And so you have these, you have this variation vertically in the data between where the points actually are and where they are predicted to be on the line or in the higher dimensional case, the hyperplane. So we define three things. So the first is the total sum of squares or total SS. And this, these are the sum of the square deviations of Y from its mean. So the total sum of squares is equal to the sum over all the observations, i equals 1 to n, of yi minus y bar squared. So the sum of the squared deviations of y from its mean. Then when we come back to the parts of the regression, the part that can be explained by the regression and the part that can't. So this is going to be our total variation in Y. So we have the square of the deviations of the actual observed values for the response and the sample mean of the response. And to tie into our numbering on the previous page, the first part is the regression sum of squares. So here we have the regression sum of squares as the sum over the, all the observations, i goes from 1 to n, of yi hat, which is the fitted value in the ith case, minus y bar squared. And so this is the variation in the response predicted by the regression. And we can think of that intuitively as 
Here you have your predicted value for the response in the ith case, and here you have its sample mean. So your, your regression is predicting that this will be how the ith response differs from its mean. The other piece is called the sum of the squared residuals. or the residual error sum of squares. And this is defined as the sum i ranging from 1 to n, so the sum over the observations, of the response yi minus that fitted value yi hat squared. And this is the variation in y that is not predicted by the regression. And often we write it SSE. And the reason why this is not predicted by the regression is because this is how much we were off by. The yi is the actual observed yi, and the yi hat is the predicted yi. Now, if you actually think about what that is geometrically, that is actually the difference here. So this would be, say, yi, if we think about the vertical axis values, and this would be yi hat. So that difference is the ith term in this. And so what that also means is that this expression here is our estimator of the ith white noise term. And remember, the whole idea of the best fit line is in this least square sense. And so we can think of this as the, we call these residuals. So this would be the ith residual. So the actual value of the sample value of the ith white noise term after we've done the fit. So this is, this is how much, each one of these terms is how much we were off by for the ith case, for the regression. And then our result that allows us to now put these together to say something about our regression's quality is the total sum of squares is equal to the sum of these two. So the total sum of squares is equal to the regression sum of squares and the residual error sum of squares, or the SSE. And the key thing to recognize is now we want to talk about a measurement of quality of our regression based on what we have here. And by the way, when you look at this and say, well, why are we defining this all in terms of the difference, differences squared? It's because we're doing a least squares problem. So all of these deviations are squared in our least squared fit. And as a result, we don't just look at their differences. We look at the squared differences. Think of it as really syncing up this analysis to the idea that our regression is a result of a least squares fit. Well, why don't we think in terms of percentage? The regression sum of squares, that's the variation in the response that's explained by the regression. The total sum of square error, that's the total variation in the regression. So why don't we think in terms of percentage? Let's think of the regression sum of squares over the total sum of squares. And now we can think of this as a percentage. You have the total variation in the bottom and the variation in the data explained by, by the regression in the top, which we know is smaller than the total sum of squares. And everything in this equation that's in the box here Every term is non-negative. So this is going to be a percentage between 0 and 1. And that can be thought as a measure of quality of the regression. And we give it a special name. 
We call it r square. We can also think of our r square written in this way, where we solve this boxed equation for the regression sum of squares. So we get the total sum of squared errors minus SSE. And we put that in the numerator. And so we can rewrite that as 1 minus the sum of squared errors over, over the total sum of squares. And we will revisit that when we do something called the adjusted R square. And it's important to recognize that this is a measure of the proportion of the total variation in Y that can be explained linearly by the predictors X. And it's very important to keep in mind that we're working in a linear world here. We are doing a linear regression. And so any information that's explained by this regression is a result of the linearity of this model, the linear, the linear regression. So let's now start to think about different cases, specifically the case where P is equal to one, only one predictor, and the case where we have P greater than one, more than one predictor. P equals one, then we have a single predictor, X. In this case, that R square simplifies to what we'll write as say little r square of X and Y or the sample correlation between X and Y. So this is a very nice interpretation. In the case where you have a univariate regression model, your R square, this measure of quality on a percentage basis, is simply the square of the sample correlation coefficient between the X data and the Y data which makes sense. That correlation coefficient tells you something about the strength of the linear relationship between X and Y. This doesn't work if P is bigger than one because correlation is an operation on two variables. We don't have it defined for the relationship of say Y to multiple predictors. But we can interpret it in the following way. So if we look at the general case, that R squared can be thought of as the correlation coefficient squared between the predicted values, Y hat and Y. In that sense, and this is a hand wavy, really intuitive statement, but not a mathematically precise one. In the case when P is bigger than one, you can think of R square as the multiple correlation between Y and its predictors. But really the, the main idea here is captured with this. We, we break the regression, the variation, so the square of those terms into this total sum of squares, the regression sum of squared errors, which is the piece explained by the regression, and the sum of squared errors, the piece not explained by the regression. And that very naturally gives us this R square, which is this percentage that tells us how much percentage variation in the data in the response is explained by the predictors. In closing, let's also look at this idea of degrees of freedom. So when we actually perform this regression, we have n total degrees of freedom. Usually, we abbreviate that DOF. And we use up degrees of freedom as we actually estimate things. So we can think of a chart here where we have degrees of freedom, think of as consuming them, taking them out of the system. So in our regression model, we have the intercept that we have to estimate. And that uses one degree of freedom. Then we have P predictor slopes, P or loadings, we have the betas. And so that consumes P degrees of freedom. And then we can think of the rest as being 
part of the least squares best fitting process. And in the least squares best fitting process, what we're really doing is minimizing the sum of those squared errors. Or you could think of doing a estimate, a best fitting estimate of the residuals for the white noise terms. Well, the white noise, the epsilon i, are white noise with mean zero and variance sigma epsilon squared. So we can think of the rest of the process as dealing with the one parameter for those white noise terms, namely their variance. And the rest of the degrees of freedom go to that process. So we have n minus the quantity p plus 1, or n minus p minus 1. And we will look at a next step where we make an adjustment to r square to account for the fact that these are actually the degrees of freedom in the system in our least squares fit. And that will be the next lecture, part two of this analysis of variance.